So I'm going to zoom in right into the topic what um, Pastor Godfrey told me to talk about, and that is what comes first for the church, the rapture or the great tribulation. <clears throat> and even before we delve in deeper into the subject, I want us to read what the Bible says in Acts 17, verse 11. The Bible says, now the Bereans were more noble-minded than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if these teachings were true. Now, I find the scripture pretty fascinating. We see someone like Paul, you know, speaking to the people of Berea. And the Bible says, after such a great person like Paul had preached to them, they still went for the scriptures to see if what Paul had said was true and it aligned with the scriptures. And when they did that, the Holy Spirit said they were noble-minded. And that is the attitude God wants us to have today because what was written at four time, the Bible says, was written for our learning. So the Bible expects us to have the same attitude like that of the Bereans. So as we approach today's um, teaching, today's preaching, I want us to just put everything aside, whatever our traditions are, whatever we may have learned in the past about the end times, and let us look into the scriptures together to see exactly what the Bible is saying. This will mean that if I say anything that is, I can't prove with the scriptures, as best just consider it's like an opinion, and you know, or can just throw it away. <clears throat> the Bible says only the word of God is given for doctrine. We don't build doctrines based on opinions. So let's lay our traditions, our views, our personal preferences aside, and let's just look at the Bible and form our doctrines based on what the Bible is saying. Um, you know, in 2 Corinthians um, 3.18, the Bible says that we all with an unveiled face beholding us in the mirror, the glory of God are being transformed into that same image from glory to glory. What the text says is that it's when we um, behold the glory of God with an unveiled face that we are transformed into that image, which means you can still see Jesus behold his glory. But as long as you are doing that with a veiled face, you are not transformed into his image, you are transformed into that image when we behold him with an unveiled face. And I believe some of the veils that sometimes cover our eyes, our own personal doctrines, our points of views, our biases, you know, and we approach the scriptures with these veils. As long as we approach the scriptures with these veils, we become like those who always study and never come to the knowledge of the truth. So let's remove all these veils and approach the word like the Bereans to see what the Bible says. If I say something that doesn't agree with the word, it's an opinion, forget about it. But on the other hand, if I say something that also lines up with the word specifically, but also contradicts your view, then you have a responsibility to decide whether you go with what the Bible says or you stick with what um, you have in mind. And I think for Christians, the, the choice is clear. If you are really following Christ, then the choice is to stick with what the Bible says. Amen. 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 So with this preamble, I'll delve in right into the topic, and we are, we are talking uh, about the subjects. What comes first for the church? Is it the rapture or the great tribulation? So I'm going to use five main outlines to deal with the subject. And the first one, briefly, let's look at what the last days are and when did they start? And also, why is it important that we even pay attention to that subject in the first place? Then secondly, the second main theme, we are going to look at how the Bible defines or describes the rapture and the great tribulation because this is a, a major subject I'm going to address today, then we have to know how the Bible def defines that. Then the third point, you're going to look at the biblical proofs that is going to deal with the heart of the matter today. What does the Bible actually say about the time of the rapture in relation to the great tribulation? And afterwards, um, we will conclude with a biblical outlook the Bible wants us to have. So four main themes you're going to look at right now. All right, so now let's delve in deeper into the subject. First question, what are the last days and when did the last days start? Let's look at this from Acts chapter 2, verse 14 to 17. This is what the Bible says. But Peter, taking a stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my word. For these men are not drunk as you suppose, but it's only the third hour. It's only the third hour of the day. But this is what the but this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. 
and it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. So if you look at the text we just read, the Bible made use of the word the last days. And when you talk about the last days, biblically, I mean, the Greek word translated last days can also be translated as final days. And from the entire biblical context, it talks about the period when the world moves into its final stages and gives way to the physical return of Jesus and his kingdom to this very earth. So this is what the Bible refers to as the last days. And you can also hear it's been referred to as the end times. Now, when did the last day start? If you look at what Paul was, um, Peter was saying, it was the time of Pentecost and the crowd that had um, gathered, he actually told them that what they were experiencing, that is they witnessing the... Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir, please continue. All right. So when you look at um, what... Um, Peter was saying, addressing the crowd, he told them that they witnessing the disciples or the apostles um, speaking in tongues was what Joel prophesied that in the last days, God was going to pour out his um, spirit on all flesh. So from the words of Peter, the day of Pentecost at the, March, at the latest when the um, last day started, because he said, what you're witnessing now is what was prophesied, that in the last days, I'll pour forth my spirit on all flesh. So we know from the scriptures that the last days are the latest begun when the Holy Spirit was poured forth on the day of Pentecost. And that was in the first century, over 2,000 years ago. Paul also affirmed the same truth in 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Let's look at what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Paul said, now these things happen to them as an example, and they were written for instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So Paul in the last days was actually informing the church that they were also living in the last days. So now imagine this, if Peter and Paul were living in the last days over 2000 years ago, then right now we are living in the last of the last days. You know, it's, it's pretty much like the last days is almost finished. We're living in the last hour. And that is how serious the issue is. So having defined what the last days are and when the last days started, Let's just briefly look at why we should even pay attention to the last days. Why is it even a subject we should even pay attention to? <clears throat> now let's look at First Chronicles chapter 12, verse, 30, verse 32. I read the first part, something the Bible said about the children of Issachar. It says, and the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. This is fascinating here. This is what the Bible says. The men of Issachar, because they had understanding of the times, they knew what Israel ought to do. So the Bible is telling us that we are able to know what you are supposed to do. We're able to align ourselves with the will of God if we have an understanding of the times. The Pharisees in Jesus' day missed the simple truth. And you know, we read, in Mal um, we read in the Old Testament, they had been looking forward to the Messiah. And yes, the Messiah came and they actually killed him. Why? They had no understanding of the times. And the person they had been waiting for came, the 40 men killed him. And that's how serious the issue is if we had no understanding of the times you're living in. Understanding the will of God, what you're supposed to do in any particular season, is linked to you having understanding of the season you are living in. Derek Prince said this then, and I think it's really profound. He said that, for anyone to be relevant in any generation, the key is to find out what God is doing in that generation and join yourself with God. And in this last days, the Bible is emphatically clear that, I mean, this period, the Bible is saying that we are living in this last days. Therefore, if you're going to be relevant and be part of what God is doing, then we have that responsibility to understand what he says about the last days. Because like the children of Isaac, understanding the times it's what helps us to know what his will is. So that we also don't end up becoming like the, you know, Pharisees, you find Jesus standing in front of you, there's a person you've been waiting for, then you end up killing him, you know? So there's just one of the main reasons why it's important we have an understanding of the times we are living in. So we know what the will of God is for that season and we don't end up living contrary to what God desires. Amen. 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 Amen.
when I hear the response of Amen, it, it makes me feel like okay, I'm not talking to myself. <laughs> oh, okay. Amen. Then I will mute yeah. and support you. Oh, we are here. I'm ready you to support you. We are here. <laughs> All right. So now, before we delve in deeper into the main um, subject, let's define what the rapture is. Then afterwards, we define what the great tribulation is. So now let's look at a very classical text in scripture that really tells us what the rapture is. And we can find this in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. If someone can read it for me, I'll appreciate that. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. Yes. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. Amen. So with the text, um, Dr. Wadari, this was Paul wasn't speaking in parables. He was actually speaking to comfort those who had um, loved ones who had died in the Lord and was actually telling them that there's going to be a time when those loved ones are going to be resurrected. And the resurrection is so essential and so pivotal to the Christian faith because we learn in scripture that without the resurrection, the Christian faith is even futile. And among all men, we are those to be most pitied. So the resurrection is really tied um, to the Christian faith. And here, Paul, we find Paul actually telling them in plain words that, you know, those who are dead he uses the phrase they are sleeping they're going to come back to life and in telling them that they are going to come back to life he gives us very important um, information about the last days also he told them that this is going to happen jesus is first going to come and when he appears this is going to be a trumpet sound and the dead in christ will rise first then those of us alive who did not die but are living at that point in time you will be caught up with the resurrected saints to meet Jesus in the air. <clears throat> so it's from that word caught up that has been translated as rapture. The Greek word is hapezo, and it talks about carrying somebody off with force or snatching out. And in Latin, that same word is read as rapturo, and from which we get the English word rapture. So you can find people arguing and saying, you know, there's no rapture in the Bible. But... Um, Really, that is quite a naive statement because it depends on the kind of translation you are using. You know, that rapture means being caught up. The Bible actually says that when Jesus comes, we are going to be caught up to meet him in the air. And if you want to use a Bible that says rapture, that's fine. If you want to use a Bible that says um, caught up, that's fine. But that is really established in scripture as an actual event that is going to happen. What I want us to really remember concerning the rapture is that it's not a standalone event with what um, Dr. Buna read. It's linked with the resurrection of the dead in Christ. And I think when we forget this association, we can always get the timing wrong. Without the resurrection, there is no rapture. So anytime you hear rapture, first think about resurrection because the dead in Christ has to rise first before those of our as well who did not die, we'll be caught up together with them to meet Jesus in there. So a very key point I always want us to remember, which is going to help us in understanding the rapture, is the fact that it's not a standalone event, but it is linked with the resurrection of the dead. And that is specifically the resurrection of the dead in Christ. So having defined the rapture, looking at what the Bible says about it, let's, let us also look at what um, the Great Tribulation is. Now, when you look at Matthew 24, 1 to 3, Jesus told his disciples that um, the temple, that was a temple that was that was existing in Jesus' day, was going to be destroyed. <laughs> the disciples thought it was fascinating. You know, they went and they asked Jesus, when is this thing going to happen? And interestingly, if you read the verse 3, let's read um, Matthew 24, verse 3. They asked Jesus three questions. And they said, 
As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things happen? Because Jesus had just told them that the temple was going to be destroyed. <clears throat> and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So right from Matthew 24, verse 4, going downwards, Jesus started telling them exactly what was going to precede his coming. And interestingly, one of the things he said in verse 21 was this, for then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. We find this in Matthew 24, 21. And you know that what Jesus said in Matthew 24, it's also recorded in Mark 13 and Luke 21. And when you put all these um, passages together, it helps us to get a very deeper understanding and appreciation of what Jesus was saying. So one of the signs Jesus listed to precede his coming in addressing the questions um, the disciples asked him was the fact that there was going to be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world, nor ever will. You know, so in Jesus' world, this is a sign that must precede his coming. And if you look at the fact that in history, we've experienced the world wars, you know, we've had World War One, World War Two, and yet Jesus is saying there's going to come a trouble such that, you know, all these wars and all these um, struggles that have prevailed in the past will pale in comparison to it. So this is an event we must take seriously. Jesus is not telling us to scare us. That is not, you know, how he he deals with us. He actually said the things he tells us so that in him we will have peace. He tells us these things so that we can be aware of what is happening and how we are supposed to posture ourselves. And this is what is really important here. Now, the Great Tribulation and the Rapture, there are two main end time concepts that really influence our understanding of the end times and our role in it. Now, consider this. If indeed the Rapture will happen before the Great Tribulation, then really we don't need any special teaching on how we are, we are supposed to survive in the Great Tribulation because you're not going to be here anyway. And if that's the case, then it's really in order that the book of Revelation, we don't even lay that much emphasis on it and it doesn't really concern us, you know. What we should be focusing on is we really getting ourselves ready for the Lord's coming and also helping others as well. And we don't need to really pay that much attention to the Great Tribulation because it doesn't really concern us. But on the other hand, if it is really true that the church will also go through the Great Tribulation and God has given us specific keys with which we need to go through the Great Tribulation and be victorious, and then we assume that we are going to escape it and we find ourselves in the Great Tribulation, then this will mean that all this while we have been working on a deception. And that is a very serious thing. And in Hosea 4, the Bible says that for lack of knowledge, my people perish. And if it's in the time of trouble that I want to prepare, you're already late. And if that's the case, Christians, we have, been pray, um, we have been forewarned that we are going to go through the Great Tribulation and we have no knowledge about what you're supposed to do during that time. Then I think and I really believe people are going to needlessly perish during that time. And they shouldn't have if you have just paid attention to what the Bible is saying. That is what I believe is a very serious matter we treat in the Bible. We, we really understand so that we know what you're supposed to do. If you're really going to go through it, then pastors and teachers and prophets we know how to prepare the church for what you're going to deal with so that we don't have all these um, needless casualties having to go through the Great Tribulation. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So I think this Amen. gives us a really um, important basis for us to learn the timing of the rapture in relation to the Great Tribulation. And I liked how Pastor Godfrey framed it. What should the church be preparing for? This is the key. If we are really going to face a great tribulation and we are here thinking we are going to escape it, then that's going to be really problematic. On the other hand, if you are going to, you know, really go through the rapture first, then there wouldn't be any alarm for us to be talking about the great tribulation and, you know, we should rather be focused on what really matters. So now let's delve um, deeply into the subject and see exactly what the Bible says. Now, at this point in time, I want everybody to have your Berean cup on. Let us look at the text and see exactly what the Bible is saying. Now, if you go through the church, I believe possibly the most predominant end time teaching now is the fact that it is the presence of the church on earth that is preventing the Antichrist from being revealed. And once the church is taken out of the earth or taken out of the planet, then the Antichrist will be revealed. 
So I, I think I've heard songs being, you know, sung about this, the fact that when the saints are gone, there's no more grace, there's no more mercy. That's a Christ is coming. And for the fact that we are here, that's a Christ can never come on the scene. It's, it's by far, I believe, is the most predominant view in the church now. But interestingly, what is used to support, or one of the main texts that is used to support this text, um, supports this view is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So let us just read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 to 4, and see what the Bible exactly says about this. So this was what, this, this what 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 4 says, and I read, Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed by a spirit or a message or a letter as if coming from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Verse three, let no one in any way deceive you for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as God. Amen. Amen. This is really Amen. interesting. When we take 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul begins the passage by telling us exactly what he's addressing. And this is what he says in the very first verse. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. So what is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him? In his first letter to the Thessalonians, he had already told them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that indeed Jesus was going to come and the dead was going to be resurrected and the living and the dead, those who just got resurrected, we are going to be caught up to meet Jesus in the air. We are going to be gathered together to him in the air. So when Paul told the church that now I'm going to talk to you about the coming of the Lord and are being gathered together with him, everybody in the Thessalonian church who knew about the first letter reading this would definitely know that Paul was talking about the coming of Jesus and the rapture. And Paul actually states by saying that this is what I'm going to address in the very first verse. Now pay attention to this. If Paul started in the very first verse and said that he was going to address the rapture and the coming of Jesus, then he moves on to the verse number two and talks about something entirely different than Paul lied. And we have no basis to even trust the Bible because the Bible says, I'm going to do this. You come into the next point. Then he starts talking about something totally unrelated. And because the Bible says that God cannot lie, you know, the Bible didn't say God will not lie. It says God cannot lie. I have the habits that I don't want to lie, but it's not because I don't have the ability to lie. I can lie, but because of God and because of grace, I'm learning not to lie. But with God, the Bible says he cannot lie. It's impossible for him to lie. If what you are seeing as a chair, God tells you it's a table, then you had better believe it because it's a table, because he sees further and deeper than what we can see. So in the same way, in verse one, when the Bible says, I'm going to talk to you about the rapture and the um, coming of Jesus, then we know that that's exactly what Paul talked about in the passage. It will make no sense for the Bible to tell us that I'm going to talk to you about the rapture and the coming of Jesus in verse one. Then he goes to verse two and then starts talking about something entirely different. And I'm establishing this point to know exactly what Second Thessalonians 1 to 4, what Paul said he was going to talk about. Now, when you go to verse two of the same, after Paul indicated what he was going to talk about in verse two, this is what he says, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or by a message or a letter I see from us to the effects that the day of the Lord has come. Now the expression, the day of the Lord, when you look at it in the Greek, it's also translated as the day of Christ. So what's the day of Christ is Paul talking about here? Again, we don't have to guess it. He actually started in the verse one by telling us exactly what he was going to address. And he told us he was going to address the coming of the Lord and our being gathered together with him. So in context, in Paul's own words, we know that the day of the Lord he's addressing here relates to exactly what he said he was going to talk about, which is the coming of the Lord and our being gathered together with him. And in the verse three, he actually said that the coming of the Lord and our being gathered together unto him will never happen until two things happen first. And one, there has to be the apostasy. The apostasy, 
the Greek word translated apostasy is also means um, apostasy, and that means that defection from the truth. So Paul is saying that coming of the Lord and are being gathered together with him will only come one when there's the apostasy. That is many people moving away from the faith. Sadly, that is going to happen, and Paul said that is going to happen first. And this must be followed by the Antichrist being revealed. Before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I think that is going to him, can happen. And interestingly, in the verse 3, Paul actually said that to think that, you know, the church had to go first before the Antichrist can come is actually to be deceived. And one does that we should make sure that we are not deceived concerning this. That is really telling. However, this same text is read, and then we are told that it is the church that has to go before um, the Antichrist can come. Meanwhile, Paul called that deception and told us that we should be careful that we are not deceived because the coming of the Lord and are being gathered together to him cannot, in fact, it will never happen until there's first apostasy. And secondly, the man of lawlessness who is the Antichrist is revealed. So here the scripture tells us the theology that is based on the fact that the church rather has to go before the Antichrist can be revealed is deception. And in his writing to the church, he warned them guard against this deception. Now, let's go and read 2 Thessalonians chapter um, 2, verse 7. Um, Pastor Godfrey, could, can you please read that for me? 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. Yep. For the mystery of iniquity that already work, only he who now let it will let until he be taken out of the way. Amen. Amen. That, was King, that was King James, right? Dangerous King James. <laughs> if you can read this in more than, more than balance. <laughs> okay, I'll read it from the NASB. Yes, <laughs> it says, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, and only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Now, the Greek word translated way it also means, I'm probably not speaking the Greek well, which is mesos, and that means middle, taken out of the middle or taken out of the way. So when we read 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7, the Bible simply told us that there's something withholding the Antichrist from coming on the scene. And until that something or that someone is taken out of the way, the Antichrist cannot be revealed. Now, when you read 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7, and the whole of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Bible doesn't specifically tell us in the scripture what that thing or what that someone is. Secondly, if you read that text, the Bible makes no mention of the Holy Spirit in that scripture. It makes no mention of the church in that scripture, and it makes no mention of a remover from the earth in that scripture. It just simply made a statement. Something is withholding the Antichrist from being revealed. And until that thing is taken out of the way, the Antichrist cannot be revealed. So we have to figure out from the scriptures what that thing is or who that someone is. But even before we can find out who that someone is or who that something is, the Bible specifically told us who that someone is not or who that something is not. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible said, if you think that is the church that has to be taken out of the earth before the Antichrist will be revealed, you're already deceived. So although the Bible didn't tell us exactly who the person is who is preventing the Antichrist from coming on the scene, the Bible told us who that person or who that thing is not and that it is never the church. And why do you know this? Because right early on, even before he told her there's something preventing that to Christ, he said that the coming of the Lord and our being gathered together with him ain't going to happen until there's apostasy and the Antichrist comes on the scene first. Amen. Amen. Now, Amen. so who is that thing or what is that something that must happen before the Antichrist can be revealed? We are given a clue in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9. And, and I'll read that 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 to 9. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. Pay attention to verse 9. That is the, the one whose coming is in accord or is in accordance with the activity of Satan with all power and signs and false wonders. Interestingly, the Bible says that the revelation of the Antichrist or the Antichrist coming is based on an activity of Satan. But somehow we see that it's by an activity of the Holy Spirit or by an activity of the church, the church being taken out of the earth. But the Bible specifically says it is by an activity of Satan, not by an activity of the church or by an activity of the Holy Spirit. Let's read verse nine again. 
That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan. And when we go to the book of Revelation, which is beyond what you are doing today, the Bible actually gives us an activity of Satan that must take place. And when that activity of Satan takes place, we see the Antichrist come on the global scene with all power and then receiving worship and the great tribulation setting in. Because um, that is beyond the teaching of today, we are going to, um, I'm not going to delve deeper into that. In the future, if you happen to talk again, probably you can delve in deeper into that. But in 2 Thessalonians 2, what we really have to establish is the fact that Paul says that if you are there thinking that the church has to go away first before the Antichrist can be revealed, that is deception. And he emphatically tells us in verse 1 to 4 that the church, the Antichrist actually being revealed first, that has to happen before the church can be raptured and before Jesus will come. Amen. 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 But there's another question we really need to address here. So now in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, if we just read it in context, it is abundantly clear that the church will be here to see the revelation of the Antichrist. Because without the Antichrist coming first, Paul said there's no rapture. But this question can be thrown. So, so just when the Antichrist comes, does a rapture happen just when the Antichrist comes or we stay here for the entire duration of the Great Tribulation? That is a valid question. Because some may say, some may say well, okay, it's pretty clear in scripture the Antichrist has to come first. Then afterwards, we are gone. But we just go, maybe the Antichrist comes to the hour 12 o'clock by 1 p.m. Are we off? <laughs> <laughs> or do we, do we stay? one, we are gone. <laughs> Good. Yeah, so is that, is that what's going to happen? Or well, we are here for the entire duration of the Great Tribulation. And this is something we also have to address from the scriptures. Amen. 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 And now, to do this, the Bible says that in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall everything be established. So to answer this question, I'm going to give us four places in scripture where the Bible directly teaches us that the resurrection of the dead in Christ and the rapture of the church will only happen after the great tribulation, which means that the Bible directly expressly says that the church is going to be here throughout the entire duration of the great tribulation. And for the next section, I'm going to give us four places in scripture that fully and clearly establishes this for us. And after what you're going to look at the biblical outlook you are supposed to have concern in the last days. So now, the first proof, I want us to look at Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 to 6. Revelation 24 to 6. And I really will want us to look into the Bible together. So if someone can read Revelation 24 to 6, um, Dr. Bona, you can do that. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that had part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Amen. Amen. Now the scripture um, Pastor Godfrey just read for us contains a, a, very, um, a lot of very essential information. From what Pastor Godfrey read, the Bible actually said that there's going to come a time where faithful believers who have died will be brought back to life to reign with Christ for a period of thousand years. And the Bible refers to this resurrection that will bring people to life to reign with Christ, the first resurrection. It's interesting that the Bible calls it the first resurrection and distinguishes from every other resurrection. And one of the very clear definitions of the first resurrection is the fact that it brings the dead to life to reign with Christ for a thousand years. Now, in Christian circles, that thousand years is referred to as the millennium. So when you hear us talk about the millennium or the millennial reign of Christ, there's a fact that, you know, Jesus is going to come after there's a resurrection and then it's going to reign for a thousand years. So in Revelation 20, 
Revelation 24 to 6, the Bible is very clear that there's going to be a first resurrection. <clears throat> what is the first resurrection? A resurrection that is going to bring people to Christ to reign in the millennium. Now, note this. It's being called the first resurrection. It means that there's no other resurrection prior to it. There's no other resurrection before. It's that brings the dead to life to reign with Christ because it's called the first resurrection. It's the first one. And interestingly, the Bible also says that the rest of the dead did not come to life until the millennium was over, meaning that the first resurrection is the only resurrection that is going to take place in this church age to bring the dead in Christ to reign with God in the millennium. Why? Because the next and only other such resurrection will happen after the thousand year reign is over, meaning that the first resurrection is the only resurrection to happen in the church age to bring the dead in Christ, to win with Christ. This also means that the first resurrection is the same resurrection Paul talked about, which also bring the dead in Christ. Because if you look at what Paul talked about, before the first resurrection, I mean, the resurrection Paul talked about will take place even before Jesus sets his feet on the earth to establish the millennium kingdom. Because when we read Paul's account in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 to 18, he said Jesus appears in the air. There's a trumpet sound. The dead in Christ are resurrected. And we are caught up to meet Jesus in the air. But when we read all of Revelation chapter 20, the Bible says that the millennium is going to take place on this very earth. Jesus actually alights on the ground. And the resurrection Paul talked about also takes place even before the millennium starts. When it comes to Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, it says, the Bible indicates that the first resurrection is the only resurrection to bring the dead in Christ to life, to reign in the millennium. Amen. Amen. And interestingly, John went on and he gave us further details about the first resurrection and he said that the first resurrection will bring to life those who were beheaded for refusing to take the mark of the beast mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when you study revelation chapter 13 and 14 the mark of the beast is only enforced during the great tribulation which means that the great tribulation happening first is a prerequisite for the first resurrection to take place because without the great tribulation happening first there cannot be christians who die for refusing the, the the mark of the beast without the great tribulation happening first we cannot even have the introduction of the mark of the beast then we cannot even have christians who refuse the mark of the beast and who will be beheaded and then have to be resurrected at the first resurrection so what the bible is actually telling us here is that the first resurrection cannot happen until there's first the great tribulation because by definition the first resurrection has to bring to life those who die in the great tribulation for refusing the mark of the beast. And when you compare Revelation 24 to this with 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, as I mentioned earlier, without the resurrection, there is no rapture of the church. So the Bible emphatically tells us that the first resurrection is that same resurrection which happens with the rapture of the church because it's the only resurrection to happen in the church age to bring people to reign with Christ. And Revelation 24 to 6, one of the key functions of the first resurrection is to bring to life those who die in the great tribulation for refusing the mark of the beast. So essentially, what the Bible actually tells us is the fact that without the great tribulation happening first, there cannot be any first resurrection. And without the resurrection, there's no rapture. So here in Revelation 24, it says, this is our first proof when the Bible emphatically tells us that when the Antichrist comes at 12 o'clock, we are not going at 12.01. We are here for the entire duration of the Great Tribulation period because a resurrection can only happen to bring to life all those who die for their faith and for refusing the mark of the beast. Amen. Amen. Yet the Bible says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall a thing be established. So here's one proof in the Bible where the Bible emphatically says that indeed the Great Tribulation happening first is actually a trigger for the rapture to happen in the resurrection. Whenever I think about rapture, I think about resurrection because without resurrection, there's no rapture. In Revelation 24, it says there has to be a Great Tribulation first. Then people have to die and the first resurrection has to bring them to life. If the first resurrection happens before the Great Tribulation, then the Bible will defeat itself. Then there, there, there is another resurrection, even before the first resurrection, that brings the sin to Christ to reign with Jesus. So we know, according to the Bible, the first resurrection can only happen after the Great Tribulation because it must bring to life those who die in the Great Tribulation for refusing the mark of the beast. Now let's look at the second proof where the Bible emphatically says that um, the rapture will happen after the great tribulation. And Pastor Godfrey, can you read Matthew 24, 1 to 2 for me? 
Matthew 24. Please, are you comfortable with my dangerous King James? Yes. Yes, <laughs> when it's, sir. When it's weird, you will change it. <laughs> Matthew 24, 1 to 2. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Um, this verse, add verse verse three. Three. Yeah. And as he sat upon Mount Olives, Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things <coughs> be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Amen. Amen. So actually, when you read Matthew 24, from verse 4 downwards, Jesus was actually answering the question of his disciples because he had told them from verse 1 to 3, he told them that the temple, there was so much, you know, uh, they love the temple, telling Jesus, look at these beautiful buildings. And Jesus told them, this temple is going to be destroyed. And they being alarmed, I believe, they came to ask Jesus these questions. When will this then happen? That is, when, when are these buildings going to be destroyed? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And from verse 4, Jesus actually started giving them the events that are going to lead up to his coming. And so when we start reading from verse 4 downwards, we see Jesus talking about the fact that there's going to be deception. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be famines. There's going to be pestilences. There's going to be great persecution. Now, bear in mind that the deception and the wars and rumors of wars, they don't take place in heaven. They take place on the earth. So Jesus was telling the disciples what they were going to face on the earth before his coming. And from Matthew 24, verse 4 to 6, um, Matthew 24, from verse 4 to verse 14, we see Jesus giving them the signs that are going to happen. And interestingly, in verse 21, he also told them this. Please read verse 21 for me, Matthew 24. And that's also one of the signs that was going to precede his coming, verse 21. Verse 21, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, mm -hmm. no, nor ever shall be. Amen. Amen. So as part of the as part of the things was telling them, there's going to be wars, rumors of wars, there's going to be this and that, famines, persecution. Then they also added in verse 21 that there's going to be a great tribulation, tribulation. such as the world has never seen and will never again see. And what happens after the Great Tribulation? Please read Matthew 24, verse 29. Matthew 24, verse 29. To 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall the, son of, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall be the tribes of the earth mourn, sorry, and they shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and glory, and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, Amen. and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Amen. Amen. So interestingly, we see Jesus listen the things that are going to happen and we see them exactly. actually going on if you read from matthew 24 exactly. like little things then they keep on compounding compounding he calls the first four even the first four major signs he called them the beginning of sorrows then there's going to be a great tribulation that's going to happen and he said but immediately after the tribulation of those days the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken <laughs> And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. When you read versions like the King James, you see they will gather them from one end of the heaven. One, the sky there is translated as heaven. If you check the Greek word, the word translated heaven also means the sky. So what Jesus literally told them that when he comes, his elects will be gathered in the sky to him. So if you just paid attention to exactly what Jesus said, when they asked Jesus what is going to precede your coming, he told them there's, there are going to be these signs, wars, rumors of wars, deception. There's going to be a great tribulation. 
And then I'm going to come after the great tribulation. Mm -hmm. So according to the words of Jesus in Matthew 24, he emphatically, and he wasn't speaking in parables because he was actually answering the questions of his disciples. The Bible said that, you know, even when Jesus spoke in parables with his disciples, he explained them in plain language. And here in Matthew 24, he was talking to the disciples, not in parables essentially, but in plain language. And he told them he was going to come after the great tribulation. Now, if we just pay attention to what Jesus himself said, I think it just puts everything to rest. But I think for the um, for the sake of other things that have popped up, let us delve in a bit deeper. I want us to pay attention to what Jesus said will accompany his coming after the great tribulation. Pastor Wilfred, can we read verse 31 again? Um, verse 31. And, and he shall send his angels. Okay, sorry, dead. please read the whole of 29 to 31. Yes, please. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, and from, and from one end of heaven to the other. Amen. So with the text Pastor Godfrey just read, Jesus has really said that when his coming after the great tribulation is this mm -hmm. way, he comes on the clouds of the sky. Please pay attention to the clouds on the sky. He also said that when he's coming after the great tribulation, his saint will be on the earth being persecuted. And then when he comes, there's going to be a trumpet sound. Then his saints will be gathered together to him in the sky. So if you read Matthew 24, 29 to 31, these are the characteristics Jesus said um, define his coming after the great tribulation. One, he comes on the clouds of the sky. Then there's a trumpet sound. There are angels involved. Then the saints are gathered from the earth. They are gathered to, together to him in the sky. Now, when we look at the classical rapture text in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to 18, we find that Paul was basically quoting Jesus. Paul said exactly the same thing. He said, one, when Jesus comes, first Jesus will come from, come alone. He comes, maybe there'll be angels accompanying him. We can delve deeper into that. But Jesus comes, then the, a trumpet sound goes forth. Then the saints are resurrected. Then they are gathered from the earth to meet him in the sky. So we find Paul basically quoting Jesus. Can someone please read First Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18? And let's compare what Jesus said is coming in Matthew 24 will be and what Paul also quoted. Essentially, Paul just it's, repeated. Uh, should I first start from the 13 or should I should pick it up from uh, 16, 16, yes. 16 and 17, yeah. For the Lord himself shall be sent from heaven with a shout mm -hmm. and with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then shall we, which are alive and remain, be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Amen. So these are the similarities I want us to see. Jesus said, I'm going to appear in the sky. Matthew 24 says the same thing. In Matthew 24, Jesus said, I'm going to come. There's going to be trumpets involved. Paul said there's going to be trumpets. And Jesus said, when I come in the air, my saints are gathered together in the sky. Paul said they're going to be caught up to me, Jesus in the sky. It's just a repetition of what Jesus said. But when you present this to some, they usually say, no, Matthew 24 is rather referring to Revelation chapter 19. And they refer to Revelation chapter 19 as the second coming. So now I want us to go to Revelation chapter 19 and see what Revelation 19 also says. And now let's read Revelation 19, 11 to 16. And I, I want everybody to really look into the scripture so that we can see if Matthew 24 looks like Revelation 19 or it looks like 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 because all these texts are talking about Jesus' appearing. Now I'll read from Revelation 19, 11 to 16. And that's what the Bible says. And John said, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. Verse 12. His eyes are a flame of fire, 
and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself, verse 13. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his tie, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. So now when you look at Revelation 19, John also talks about a different coming of Jesus. In Revelation 19, he said that he saw Jesus coming on a white horse. Meanwhile, when you look at Matthew 24, there is no white horse mentioned. Jesus says he comes. There are no white horses in Matthew 24. Also, in Matthew 24, in Revelation 19, which we just read, Jesus doesn't come alone with white horses. He comes with white horses, with the armies of heaven also in white horses following him, and these armies are clothed in fine linen. If you just read the preceding verses in Revelation 19, these armies include the saints, because the Bible says the fine linen are the righteous acts of the saint. So in Revelation 19, we see that Jesus comes on a horse, and the saints are following him on white horses. In Matthew 24 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Jesus doesn't come on a horse. He rather comes and there's a trumpet that goes forth. In Revelation 19, there's no trumpet. Secondly, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the saints are not carried by horses to meet Jesus in the air. And in Matthew 24, the saints are not carried on white horses to meet Jesus in the air. Paul tells us that they are caught up, and the Greek word is hapazo, and that is to be snatched out by force. Whereas in Revelation 19, we see the saints sitting on horses. Also in Revelation 19, we see Jesus and the saints moving from heaven. And when we read the whole of Revelation 19, they actually alight on the earth. Whereas in Matthew 24 and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the meeting place is the air. So we see that even the direction of the saints are different. Whereas in Revelation 19, the saints and Jesus are coming on white horses. In Revelation, in 1 Thessalonians 4 and in Matthew 24, the saints rather move up. And also with what Pastor Godfrey read in Matthew 24, the Bible said that when the earth, the whole earth, they see Jesus coming, they mourn and weep. We read Revelation 19, and when the people on the earth they see Jesus coming, they don't mourn and weep. They actually gather to make war against Jesus. As silly as it gets, that's what happens. And read in Revelation 19 to the end. They see Jesus coming and they actually gather to make war against him and those he comes with. So there's no similarity between Revelation 19 and Matthew 24 for us to group them as one. There's practically no sameness between them. Rather, when we see Matthew 24, you see Paul quoting Matthew 24 using practically the same words of Jesus. And in accordance with Jesus' words, he said that, that his coming where he comes not with horses, but with a trumpet, angels involved, gathering the same to him. The Bible says that in Jesus' own words, that coming is after the great tribulation. So when you just compare Matthew 24 in Jesus' own words and what Paul said, Jesus and Paul affirm the fact that it's after the great tribulation that the rapture happens. Amen. Amen. Revelation 19 and Matthew 24 there's nothing in common we can never classify them as one and now please hold on let me prove something to you basically they refer to revelation 19 as the second coming but actually when you go to, through the scriptures the bible rather refers to the rapture as the second coming and let, let me prove that in scripture can somebody read hebrews 9 verse 28 hebrews 9 verse 28 verse 28 mm -hmm. so so christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Amen. Amen. So with the text, Pastor Godfrey just read, the Bible actually said that Jesus came a first time and he's going to come a second time. And this is the characteristics the Bible used to define the second coming. He said that in the second coming, he's coming for those one who are eagerly waiting for him. And to when he comes, he brings them salvation. Now, when you look at the Greek word translated salvation in Hebrews 9, 28, it's not sozo, which we mean, we know to be confessing Jesus and being saved. This word salvation also means being delivered from trouble, being delivered from molestation of enemies, and it's associated with the coming of Jesus Christ. So in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, the Bible defines the second coming of Jesus at that coming, 
when he comes to deliver his people, those who are eagerly waiting for him to I'm bring them to deliverance from molestation, to bring them salvation. That salvation is molesta- um, deliverance from molestation from enemies or deliverance from earthly else. Amen. Amen. Now, when you look at Revelation Amen. chapter 19, now before I even go on deeper, let me, let me just briefly summarize how Revelation 24 and Revelation 19 fits. So as Jesus said, it's immediately after his Immediately after the great tribulation, there are signs in the skies and in the in the heavens, and afterwards he comes. And when he comes, the saints are gathered together and we meet him in the air. Now, when we meet him in the air, we don't make a U-turn back to the earth. We go to heaven for what you call the marriage supper of the Lamb. And after the marriage supper of the Lamb, Jesus and the saints come back to the earth on white horses. So the, the Bible indeed talks about two distinct coming. One is at the rapture where we are caught up to meet Jesus in the air and first Thessalonians chapter 4 and Matthew 24 says that's what's going to happen and in Jesus's own words when you compare that with first Thessalonians chapter 4 the resurrection and the rapture according to Jesus that coming is after the great tribulation but when we come to Matthew 24 Revelation 19 that is a coming after the marriage supper of the lamb in heaven and when the saints are coming in um the saints are coming to Jesus in Revelation chapter 19 they are not coming to be delivered from any earthly ill. They're already in heaven. They've already been in heaven and enjoying heavenly bliss. They had enjoyed the marriage supper of the Lamb, and they, they don't need any deliverance from any molestation in heaven. But it's at the rapture that the saints had gone through the great tribulation. They are suffered. And when Jesus comes, the Bible says the second coming, the purpose of the second coming is to bring deliverance for those who are waiting on him. In Revelation 19, the saints are not waiting for Jesus. They're already with him in heaven. They, they just had the marriage supper of the Lamb. And they come together. But it's at the rapture that we have saints on the earth waiting for Jesus. And when Jesus comes, the Bible says those who are eagerly waiting for him, he brings them deliverance and deliverance from the earthly ills. Amen. Amen. But according to Hebrews 9.28, the second coming is that coming of Jesus where he delivers his saints from trouble. And that only happens when the rapture takes place. So this understanding that all oh, the rapture and the second coming are different, I believe that is even biblically defensible if you understand how the Bible defines the second coming according to Hebrews 9.28. In the words of Jesus, the rapture is the second coming. And indeed, Hebrews 9.28 said that the first time was when Jesus came and he died for the sins of many and the salvation he brought us is sozo. But now the second coming is bringing the Greek word is soteria, where he's bringing deliverance from those who, um, who are experiencing trouble and trials, earthly ills, he brings them deliverance. So really, according to the scriptures, the second coming is the rapture. So how do we refer to the coming revelation chapter 19? The Bible doesn't give us a term to refer to it, just as, like the way he describes um, the second coming in Hebrews 9, 28. But if some refer to it as a third coming, in my view, I think that makes perfect sense because it's a subsequent coming after the second coming of Jesus. Some also refer to it as a triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And that makes perfect sense to me as well, because as we delve in deeper in the book of Revelation and in Zechariah, we realize that when Jesus comes, he actually marches into Jerusalem and he rules from there. So indeed, the Bible talks about two comings. The first is when he came as a baby. The second one is when he brings deliverance to those waiting for him. And that can definitely not refer to Revelation 19, because Revelation 19, the saints are not waiting for Jesus. They're already with him in heaven. Also, second coming must bring deliverance. And the saints, they are not, they don't need any deliverance from heaven. They rather come with Jesus to the earth to come and enjoy some more, to come and reign. Amen. Amen. Oh, so according to Jesus' own words in Matthew 24, his coming, where there's going to be a trumpet sound, where the saints are going to be gathered together from there to meet him in the sky, where the meeting point is the air, in Jesus' own words, happens after the great tribulation. Now, this is the second proof that shows that the church will indeed go through the great tribulation. The rapture happens after the great tribulation. I want us to give us, I want us to also look at a third proof where the Bible beautifully shows that the rapture indeed happens after the great tribulation. After the Bible said in the mouth of two or three witnesses, shall we establish stuff right? So let us look at the third one. Mm-hmm. Now, can someone read First Corinthians 15, verse 51 to 52 for me? And this is the third proof. First Corinthians 15, 15, 51 to 52. 51 to 52. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, 
in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Amen. Amen. Yeah, that's a very beautiful, like a very beautiful information you've been given. Paul said that <clears throat> the resurrection of the dead in Christ are going to happen at the last trumpet. The resurrection of the dead in Christ will happen at the last trumpet or at the sounding of the last trumpet. We also know from First Thessalonians chapter 4 that the resurrection and the rapture are tied together. So simply, if you want to know when the rapture happens in relation to the Great Tribulation, we just have to look at the Bible to see exactly when the last trumpet is blown, whether the last trumpet is blown before the Great Tribulation or after the Great Tribulation. And thankfully, we don't have to guess this. The Bible specifically tells us exactly when the um, last trumpet is blown. So let us go to the book of Revelation to see exactly when the last trumpet is blown. Now, I'll just give a summary and when we have time, go through it deeper and um, look at the text I provide. When we start with Revelation chapter four, in Revelation chapter four, John talks about an experience he had when he was caught up to heaven. Now, many look at Revelation chapter four and they go like, Revelation chapter four has to be the rapture because in Revelation chapter four, John was caught up to heaven even before he talked about the great tribulation. So Revelation chapter four has to be the rapture. But the Bible in the book of Revelation itself refused this argument. And here is it. We know that the resurrection of the dead and the rapture happened together. But in Revelation chapter four, John was caught up to heaven alone. In Revelation chapter four, John actually told us why he was caught up to heaven. He said, he heard a voice that told him, come up here and I'll show you the things that must take place. So John was caught up to heaven to be shown things that must take place in the future. And when you go to Revelation chapter 20, one of the things he saw was the resurrection even the first resurrection. So if we claim that Revelation chapter four is a rapture, then we claim that the rapture happens before the resurrection of Revelation chapter 20, which is biblically indefensible. Because the rapture and the resurrection of the dead are tied together. And it's biblically inaccurate to say that the rapture happens in Revelation chapter four. Then afterwards, we in Revelation chapter 20, the resurrection happens. According to the Bible, the resurrection and the rapture are tied together. So what happened in Revelation chapter 4? In Revelation chapter 4, John simply told us that he was caught up to heaven, and he gave us a reason why he was caught up to heaven, to be shown things that must take place hereafter, or to be shown things that would take place other than things that have already been shown him. Now, we know in the Bible that Enoch was also caught up to heaven. So people being caught up to heaven, it's not really a new experience in scripture. Paul talked about a man he knew who was also caught up to heaven and we believe that that was Paul himself now none of these experiences are the rapture why because they were not accompanied by the resurrection of the dead in Christ in the same way in Revelation chapter 4 John when John was caught up he wasn't caught up wasn't a mass catch up he was just caught up by himself but at the rapture it is it's, it's a mass catching up not just one person the dead in Christ being resurrected Plus, we, those who didn't die, all this group of people coming together and we being caught up. While well, Revelation chapter 4 was John alone who was caught up. And also at the rapture, as the Bible says, the resurrection must happen first. Without the resurrection, there's no rapture. In Revelation chapter 4, John was caught up in heaven. And while in heaven was shown the, um, the resurrection of the dead in Revelation chapter 20. So to claim that Revelation chapter 4 is the resurrection of the dead is biblically indefensible. It's just John himself telling us, I was caught up to heaven to be shown things. And that is a common experience in scripture. Elijah was caught up to heaven. You know, was caught up to heaven. And John repeats the same thing to us. So in Revelation chapter 4, when John was caught up to heaven, when you come back to Revelation chapter 6, in Revelation chapter 4 and 5, when he was caught up to heaven, he saw that Jesus was sitting on the throne. And he had a scroll in his hand. And when you reach the end of the book, we find out that actually the scroll that Jesus was holding contains the history of mankind from the time John saw it or soon after John saw it to the end when Jesus will come and reign on the earth and even the period afterwards. And when we go to Revelation chapter 6, we see Jesus opening the scroll one after the other. One thing we have to bear in mind is that the Bible says that the book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ. Usually when we open the book of Revelation, people are looking for the Antichrist. I mean, we have information about the Antichrist there, but it's not a revelation of the Antichrist. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's Jesus giving his testimony. 
And one of the core testimonies he gives in the book of Revelation, he tells us about the signs that will precede his coming. When he goes to Matthew 24, Jesus also talked about the signs that are going to precede his coming. So one of the keys to really understand the book of Revelation is to understand Matthew 24. The book of Revelation is like Matthew 24 expanded. Because Matthew 24, Jesus listed in order the things that are going to happen. It, um, that's going to precede his coming. And in the book of Revelation from chapter 6, we see Jesus telling us the things that are going to happen. That is going to precede his coming. So when you go through um, the first seal, for example, um, Pastor Godfrey, can you read Revelation 24? I'm sorry, Matthew 24, verse um, 4. Matthew, Matthew 24, verse 4, yes. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Amen. Amen. So when the disciples asked Jesus, what is the sign of your coming? The first sign he gave them was deception. Mm. When you go to Revelation chapter 6, when Jesus started showing us the things that are going to precede his coming, when the first seal was opened, you see someone sitting on a white horse. That looked like Jesus is on a white horse in Revelation 19. But when you go in deeper, you realize that whilst Jesus in Revelation 19 has um, a sword, like the sword coming from his mouth, this guy in Revelation chapter 6 had a bow. On Jesus' head was a diadem, many jeweled crowns, and this guy had something on his head that is also translated like a wreath. So when you look closely at Revelation chapter 6, the first horse, the guy there seems to be an imposter trying to fake Jesus, and we see deception in the first seal. When you go to Matthew 24, the first sign Jesus gave was deception. And when you go through Matthew 24, going through the signs, when, and when you compare with Jesus talking about what's and rumors of what's being the second sign, you go to the second seal, you also see what's and rumors of what's. Um, there's, there, there, there's somebody sitting on a horse and the person brings in war. So really the way to understand the seals, what is happening, what they represent, go through Matthew 24. And to understand it deeply, Luke brings further details. Mark brings further details. So studying Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, we're able to decode what the seals mean. They are beautifully shown because the first time Jesus said it wasn't in the book of Revelation. He had already talked about it um, before his death. Now let's see what happened when the sixth seal was opened. And can um, you read Revelation 6, verse 12 to um, 17? Revelation. Revelation 6, 12 to 17. Yep. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, the and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Hmm. Interesting. And the stars of heaven fell onto the earth. Ah, yes, you can read now. Interesting. Even as a fig tree casted her on timely fix, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it was rolled together. And every mountain and island were removed out of their places. Amen. Please stop there. So we see when the sixth seal was open, Jesus gave us signs that will happen when the sixth seal is open. And this is the sun becoming black, a sackcloth made of hair, the whole moon becoming like blood, and the stars falling. Now let us go to Matthew 24, when Jesus was also talking about the same subject, the same telling us thing. about the things that are going to precede his coming. And he made mention of these same signs, and he told us that these are the signs that follow immediately after the great tribulation. Please read Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven, the heaven shall be shaken. Amen. So now before we go on, so we see that the same Jesus is addressing, is the same Jesus addressing the same subjects in these two places. And in the sixth seal, he, said, he says that we are going to see the sun being darkened, the moon not giving its light, the stars being fallen. We check with Matthew 24, and Jesus mentioned the exact same things, and he tells us that these are signs that follow after the Great Tribulation. So it means that when we see, by the time the sixth seal is opened, we are already introduced to the immediate period following the Great Tribulation. And there's something I also want you to pay attention here. Jesus didn't say that he was going to come immediately after the Great Tribulation. What he said in verse 29 was, but immediately after the Great Tribulation, that's Matthew 24, 29. But immediately after the Great Tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. 
and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the man, and then the sign of the man, oh, my computer just went away. Hold on, I'm bringing it back. Okay, thank you, it just came back. Verse 30, and then the sign of the son of man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. So in the words of Jesus, the immediate signs following the great tribulation is why it's coming. It's the signs that happens in the heavens. And afterwards, the sign of the son of man appears, then he comes. So how long, that period afterwards, how long is it? We are not told in Matthew 24. We only see that period in, um, when you study the book of Revelation. And again, in the future, if you have the time to delve in deeper into the book of Revelation, we are going to show that. But just bear in mind that that's a wrong reading of Matthew 20, Matthew 24, 29. People immediately say, Jesus said he's coming immediately after the great tribulation. That's a lie. Jesus didn't say he's coming immediately after the great tribulation. He said immediately after the great tribulation, there are things that happen in the sky. And then, or after those signs, then his sign will appear, then he will come. So how long is that period? You cannot even decipher it from the great tribulation. And also, as you've seen so far, we know that the Bible is saying the great tribulation, um, the rapture happens after the great tribulation, the two proofs with us so far. And if indeed Jesus was coming immediately after the great tribulation, then we can predict exactly when Jesus will come. Because from the middle of the great tribulation to the end of the great tribulation, the Bible says that's going to take 1260 days, according to um, Revelation chapter 12 and 13. Revelation 13, it says 42 months. In Revelation 12, he gives the figure in this 12, 60 days. And if indeed Jesus was coming immediately after the great tribulation, then we can predict exactly when the rapture will take place. We just have to count, count 12, 60 days from the middle of the great tribulation and we can point to the exact time Jesus is coming. Yet Jesus said nobody can predict the exact day or they are. So the Bible is emphatic that Jesus doesn't come immediately after the great tribulation. And that is abundantly clear in the book of Revelation. But what I want us to focus on here is that by the sixth seal in Revelation chapter 6, we see the end of the great tribulation. However, when you go from the first seal to the sixth seal, no mention is made of the resurrection of the dead and no mention is made of the rapture taking place. And yes, by the end of the great tribulation, the sixth seal, and yes, at the sixth seal, we see that the great tribulation has come to an end. So what happens when the seventh seal is opened? So let's look at what the what happens when the seventh seal is opened after the great tribulation. And Pastor Godfrey, can you read Revelation chapter 8? Revelation 8. Yes. So we know that at the end of the sixth seal, the immediate period following the great tribulation has been shown. And if you go home, you can check, read from Revelation chapter 1, from the third, Revelation chapter 6, from the first seal to the fifth seal, there's no mention made of the resurrection taking place. And without the resurrection, there's no rapture. So let's see what happens when the seventh seal is opened. Please, should I read from verse one? Yes, please. Through to... Um, read the first three verses. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And please, please hold on. Yeah, so when the seven... So from... First seal to sixth seal, there's no mention of um, the resurrection taking place. So we will expect that probably when you open the seventh seal, you're going to see the resurrection. But when the seventh seal was opened, it wasn't the resurrection that was first seen. What was seen was um, first, there was a 30 minute silence in heaven. Then we had seven angels who had seven trumpets. Now, if you have um, seven angels, the seventh one is the last trumpet. Is, does that make sense? Because mm -hmm. if you have seven angels, the last one has to be the last. the last. The seventh one has to be the last one. So we know that when the seventh seal is opened, seven angels come out. They are given seven trumpet. And please read verse six. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Amen. So when the angels were given the seven trumpets, the seven trumpets wasn't given them just for fun. They actually had to blow them. And when they started blowing them from verse 7, the Bible says, and the first angel sounded. When the first angel blows, certain events take place. When the second angel blows, certain events take place. Up to the seventh angel or the last angel who sounded the last trumpet. And let us look at what happened when the last trumpet is sounded in Revelation chapter 11. Revelation 11. So please read Revelation 11, 15 
to 19. And let's see what happens when the last trumpet or the seventh trumpet is sounded. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. And the four and twenty-four elders, which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee signs, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and are to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy, thy great power and hast reigned. Verse 18, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou should give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to thy saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Amen. 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 So when the last trumpet, which is the seventh trumpet, seventh trumpet, so when the seventh, which is the last of the seven trumpets, were sounded, with what Pastor Godfrey read, it was declared that the time had come for God to reward his saint. When are the saints rewarded? Let us, Jesus answer this question in Luke 14, verse 13 to 14. Can someone please read Luke 13, Luke 14, verse 13 to 14. Luke 14, 13 to 14. Yes. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Amen. So in Luke 13, 14, Luke 14, 13 to 14, Jesus said that the time when the righteous are rewarded are the at the time of the resurrection of the righteous or the resurrection of the just or the resurrection of the dead in Christ. So when you go to Revelation 11, when the last trumpet was sounded and it was declared that the time has come for the saints and the prophets to receive their reward, at that time, in the words of Jesus, it was also declared that this is a time of the resurrection. And according to the words of Paul, we know that it's the resurrection that brings the rapture. So here we see that in the sixth seal, the end of the great tribulation is shown. And after the sixth seal in the seventh um, seal, when the seventh seal was opened, we see the last trumpets being blown. And the last trumpets being blown is being declared that this is the time for giving the reward to the saints. And Jesus saying the time of reward is the time of the resurrection. And in the words of Paul, the time of the resurrection is the time of the rapture. And this definitely, the book, um, the book of Revelation agrees with exactly what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, that it's at the last trumpet that the resurrection takes place. And when it comes to the book of Revelation, we see that when the last trumpet was blown, the resurrection did take place. Now the resurrection took place in the seventh seal, which was opened after the sixth seal, showing the end of the great tribulation has already been concluded. And this again, definitely proves that indeed the resurrection and the rapture happens after the great tribulation. Some will be there and say that, well, maybe the last trumpet that was sounded in the book of Revelation, that brought the dead to life, may be different from the last trumpet Paul was talking about. I mean, that is hard to defend because we see that Paul saying there's a last trumpet that is going to bring the resurrection. And we see the book of Revelation affirming that. And most importantly, we also see that the resurrection in the seventh seal indeed happens after the sixth seal. And the sixth seal, we see the end of the great tribulation. So this is the third proof where the Bible definitely affirms that indeed at the last trumpet, the resurrection is going to take place. And this last trumpet is blown after the great tribulation. Amen. Amen. And now I'm within about three minutes, I'm going to give the last proof. Then we are going to conclude. Now, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, can someone please read Revelation chapter 1, verse 1? I want to look at the last proof. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. Revelation 1, 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent Amen. and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. Amen. The opening verse of the book of Revelation tells us the audience of the book. And the Bible says this is a revelation that God gave unto his born servant. Now sinners 
and unbelievers can also learn from the book of Revelation, but they are not the primary audience according to the book of Revelation. The Bible says, this is a revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave for his born servants. Who are the born servants of God? They are those who live according to Matthew, sisters, which says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that all other things will be added unto you. The born servants are not the, even the lukewarm Christians. They are those who live according to the scripture, which says Jesus himself died for us, so that those who live will no longer live for themselves, but for, for him who died and was resurrected on their behalf. So we, we know that the book of Romans was written to the church because right at the beginning, Paul tells us that, He's writing to the saints, those in the church called saints. When it comes to the book of Revelation, the Bible tells us exactly the audience of the book. It is rather unfortunate that we've made, we've left the book as though it's for sinners, those who will be left behind to rather read it. But right at the opening verse, God tells us, no, this is a book I've written for my born servant. This also gives us one of the primary keys to understand the book of Revelation. If you want to understand the book of Revelation, then you have to be like a born servant of Christ because they are those to whom the book is written. Amen. And now, let's look at Revelation Amen. chapter 14, verse 9 to 12. Revelation so bear this in mind that the, the book of Revelation is about things that are going to happen. And the Bible is telling us that this thing, there are things that are written to the church, not to sinners, not even to lukewarm Christians who are not going to overcome, but to those who are serious with God. They are the priority. Third, sorry. Revelation 14, 9 to 12. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark on his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Amen. Can you add the verse um, 13? Okay, so 12. Okay. That's 12, yeah. That's 12. 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandment of God and faith in Jesus. And I Amen. Heard, okay. Best of thank you, Pastor. So in Revelation, so Revelation 1 1, the Bible defines for us the audience of the book yes. and who God is communicating the book to, and that is for his born servant. In Revelation 49 to 12, the Bible gives us 10 warning that no one should take the mark of the beast, because taking the mark of the beast means that you are going to end up in the lake of fire uh, forever and ever. And after giving this 10 warning, that no one should take the mark of the beast. In verse 12, if you read it in some of the more um, modern translations, the Bible says, this calls for patience and endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. What the Bible is saying is that the command not to take the mark of the beast was a command that was given to the church. Specifically the born servants, those who are working in obedience to God, and those who keep their faith in the Jesus, they are the primary audience of the book. In Revelation 14, the Bible says, after giving this one, and he tells us this one, and it's a call. If you read it like in the ESV, here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. The commandments not to take the mark of the beast is actually a commandment to the born servants of Christ. Now, if the church would be raptured before the great tribulation, why will God be telling us now, way before the Great Tribulation, since the first century, that we shouldn't take the mark of the beast? That will make no sense if we be out of here and God is telling us not to take the mark of the beast. And God telling us now that there's going to be a period that the mark of the beast is going to come and warning us that he's calling us that we shouldn't take the mark of the beast. Definitely refuse this prayer tribulation rapture teaching, letting us know that God is telling us that we shouldn't take the mark of the beast because you're going to be here and our call is to reject that mark. Amen. Amen. So here I've given us four biblical proofs where the Bible exactly tells us that the rapture of the church indeed happens of the great tribulation. And from what you've looked at, the Bible even tells us that the great tribulation happening first is actually a prerequisite for the rapture to happen. So if indeed the Bible is so clear 
that the rapture will indeed happen as a great tribulation. Why is this pre-tribulation rapture theology so prevalent in the church? Um, if you, I wrote a book here, um, what to expect mm -hmm. and how to prepare to triumph in the last days, um, a biblical perspective on the last days. And here I delve into some of the scriptures that have been used to support the pre-tribulation rapture theology and how that actually deviates from the scriptures. You can see one, one, one such example is what we read in 2 Thessalonians, where the Bible actually tells us that it's a deception to think that we have to be here before the Antichrist, we have to be gone before the Antichrist will be revealed. And the Bible actually says the direct opposite. So there are such scriptures that have been used to support the pre-trib, whereas the Bible actually says opposite. And what I found is that people did not really behave like the Berians. We came up with how we think God should behave, and we ended up going for scriptures to support how we think God should behave. But the problem is when you do that, we have to end up also bending a whole lot of scriptures. And when you read um, the book, I go in deeper into that. You can talk to Pastor Bona if you need a copy of the book. I think you can make that clear. And for every book that is sold to find out how so my tithes and offering on it to support the ministry. So because of time, I will left, I will, I will, I will leave here. And one of the main things I'll tell us when you read Luke 21, verse 30 it says, This is not supposed to bring us fear. Rather, the Bible says, For lack of knowledge, my people perish. The Bible is telling us that so that we can be prepared and be ready for what is coming. When you study the book of Daniel, one of the purpose of the great tribulation, how many of us have heard the scripture before? For those who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. When you read this in Daniel chapter 11, the Bible teaches that this scripture is actually in reference to the period of the great tribulation. When things are so tough, those who know their God will be strong and they will do exploits. In context, it's a scripture that was referenced to those in the great tribulation. And following that, the Bible said that, and those who have insights will turn many to righteousness. So it's a time when there's great trouble on the earth. People are confused. They don't know what to do, but it's a time of harvest. It's a time when those of us with insights, we tell them this is what the Bible says. And it's a period when many are going to come into the faith. And it's a period when if we know God, we are going to triumph. And here too, I delve deeper into some specific ways God tells us to prepare so that we can triumph. So it's not all doom and gloom. It's God letting us know beforehand, this is what is going to happen. I want you to prepare for it so that you can triumph and during that time, be strong and do exploits and be the person of insight who brings many to righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen.